Stay tuned for The Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Our guests waiting to be profiled are director Rupert Murray and actress Elaine J. Taylor. Our interview with director, filmmaker Rupert Murray took place on location. We talk about his 10-year career making film documentaries for Channel 4 TV in the UK, which led to Unknown White Male. This story about amnesia amazes and astonishes, astonishes virtually everyone who hears it, and I was no exception, says the director, Rupert. He felt the film had to be made. Here is Rupert Murray, director of Unknown White Male. They kept asking me my name, and that's really the last thing that I wanted to be asked, because, you know, I didn't know. He didn't have any kind of identification on him, nothing. So we thought that he got robbed. So they put him on the phone, and he said, Hello, I'm so scared, I'm scared, I'm scared. I said, you don't know who you are, you don't know your name, no? Extreme forms of memory loss to which we would give the term retrograde amnesia. Those are the rarest of all kinds of amnesia. How do you feel? I don't remember anything past last Thursday. So. Hi, Rupert. Hi. Your love affair with film started when you were really young making movies with Super 8 camera. Did your family uh, come into those whims with you? Did they like you photographing them all the time? Well, um, my love affair with, with cameras, I suppose, actually didn't, it started quite late. I was possibly about 18 or 19, and I started making uh, market research videos for advertising agencies oh. on, on, on the street. And uh, that was when I first really got interested in, in making documentaries, because I met lots of interesting people and who, who always confounded my expectations of them. And, um, and, and when I started, as I started out, um, uh, I got fascinated by cameras and to talking to people. And a, a lot of the um, uh, footage that's actually in the film, in the, in, in the film Unknown White Male, was, uh, sorry, that was, that was rubbish. That you met when you were doing those things? Well, what, what I did was um, I had this uh, uh, little Hi8 camera. Right. And I spent a lo lot of time filming out in the street during the day, and then I'd use it. In the, in the evenings and the weekends to capture her okay. movies with, uh, with my friends. I see. Then you did, when you were doing the advertising bits, um, you won in, 19, uh, in 2004, you right. won an advertising Grand Prix Gold Award for, those, uh, for a short film on drug addiction. That's right, yeah. I made a film about, uh, it was quite an incredible subject. Uh, there, there, there were four people who were um, uh, recovering from a heroin addiction. And what's com what surprised me about them was uh, their incredible lucidity uh, and, and our, uh, ability to articulate this amazing catastrophe that, it, that, 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 that they've been through. And I think this is a, it's something that I found also in, in, in Doug's situation, is that um, when you've been through a very uh, traumatic part of, it, part of your life, your ability to talk about it and explain it to other people and to discuss it um, it becomes very easy, and people like to talk about things, bad things that, that have happened to them, and people like to listen and hopefully learn from, from them. So all of this work you were doing early on it turned out to be uh, documentaries of things, listening to people talk, as you were saying, and then you went to work for Channel 4, and they were commissioning you to do these documentaries? That's right. I mean, I've always been, in, I've always been fascinated by real people, real stories. Um, I've always liked to work on my own. Uh, really, well, although, although I have a, a business partner and a filming partner, B.D. Finzi, uh, we're, we're a small team. I like that kind of intimacy that, that, that gives you, the access into people's lives that oh, gives you. Right. Uh, uh, I think the, the fantastic thing about a, a documentary film crew is you, you get to go places, um, incredible places. Uh, people welcome you into their lives. Really? Uh, and you get to experience vicariously some of their, some of their, their experiences, some of their lives. And that's a great 
great gift. When you went to Channel 4, did you get to bring the subject matter or did they tell you what to, to um, shoot? I took the idea to Channel 4. You took the ideas. So you did a lot of documentaries. You did Playing for England, which was about... Well, the, Playing for England was my first, the first documentary I ever made, and it's a film about a group of eight Sheffield uh, football fans who are completely dedicated football fans. Um, and what they, one of them did at one of the, one of the football matches, take a, a trumpet and played it at the back of the stands. And football fans in England, they like to sing. Uh, <laughs> and they, they sing and they, they clap their hands. And this guy took a, took a trumpet and blew it when their team, Sheffield Wednesday, won a goal, uh, scored a goal. And the whole uh, place erupted. And he built a band from that, from that moment. And then he got invited by the manager of the English football, national English football team, to take the band to the, to the World Cup in France in 1998. Okay. And so I followed that, so that I followed that journey, um, and there was a big debate between the real football fans and the and, and the band, who are real football fans, but about whether it's better to sing at a football match or play or play instruments. Uh, and so that was a, that was a kind of debate. Then we like went uh, to this was my war, which was Iraq, and the media coverage, and then you did Outsiders, which brought you to America, I guess, was it about that's cult right. music? That's right. That's right. Outsiders was a uh, I, I mean a fascinating subject. There was a book. Uh, written by a DJ called Erwin Chusid out of WFMU in Jersey City, uh, which we read. And he had two CDs of outsider music. And outsiders are these incredible uh, people who spend their entire lives, uh, who are dedicated to their music. They probably don't, aren't, don't become as successful as they would like. Uh, some people, they're kind of derided in some, in some circles. Maybe, I, I, I liken it to, they've got, they're very talented people, but they're maybe missing one key element. Um, some people, some of them don't sound oh, sound off key. Um, <laughs> some of them can't write songs very well, but perform very well. So they're not in, rounded performers, but they're they're so passionate about their, about about music, about expressing themselves. It's almost a, a, a compulsion. They feel that the need to do it. And so we had this this CD, uh, and we knew behind every single song there was an incredible story, an incredible person. Oh, nice. And and so we went and followed and met these people for the first time. So does, does the documentary take its own course, like Unknown White Male? Does it just follow, it just goes along? Yeah, and I mean, I like to approach a subject uh, with an open mind. I have no, uh, I ten, try not to have uh, preconceptions before, before I approach something. And often it's, it's, it's my natural curiosity uh, that, that drives the narrative. I, um, the questions that I want to ask, the things that I find exciting, um, is, is what ends up in the film. When you, you met uh, your producer, Beatty Finzi, when you were making this uh, uh, Gifted, I guess, another documentary. That's right. And then you went to work together on Unknown White Male. Yes. Well, Beatty's a fantastic, uh, um, she's, my, she's my business partner, uh, and, and we, we co-direct quite a few films. Uh, she was directing Gifted, which is a fantastic oh, uh, uh, nice. documentary about a, a, a child clarinet prodigy. It's in, uh, Julian Bliss, an incredible clar clarinetist. And, um, and so we started working together. Uh, we have different methods of, of approaching our, our work, but we, th we think about films in exactly the same way. So it's been a, we've had a fantastic working, working relationship. I decided to, we, we decided that I would direct Unknown White Male because it's such a personal story. And why? It's... How did you find that story? Well, Doug Bruce, uh, the, the central uh, uh, protagonist in the story, is, a, is an old friend of mine. I've known him for oh. 20 years. I see. Uh, since I was about 18. And, um, and I'd heard, it, uh, um, through the grapevine, that he'd lost his memory. I see. So that, you brought that to the two of you, and then you went, did you go to Bruce? How did you get him to let you make well, this film? it's very difficult, you know, when someone's lost, lost their memory, they don't know who you are. <laughs> exactly. How did he know you? What did you do? How well, did you I, convince I, him? Well, I had to, I was, I, I was quite worried for some time about how I would actually um, pose the question, do you want to make this film? because I had to introduce myself as a friend uh, first. Mm -hmm. So um, it took me about eight months, a month, but then I wrote a letter to him, introducing myself, the idea of a film, and he replied, and then I went over to meet him for the first time in New York, which is in the film. A lot of people wanted to make that movie. How did you convince him? Well, I think I, think I was about number 11, <laughs> uh, the, the, the 11th person, person uh -huh. to ask him, and I think that 
quite a few of those people had dropped out by the time I oh, by, by the time I was on the scene. They had, for whatever reason, they hadn't quite got it together. Uh, also, I, I mean, I think the main reason is is that I was I was an old friend, and I was coming from London, where he knew he had a lot of other friends, and I was going to help help him return to London and meet those friends for the first time. Oh, I so I think that, and, and also I was recommend. I, I had to say, I gave him references. I said, you know, if you want to find out about me, speak to these people. And so he, he asked all these people about, about me, and, and luckily they said good things. Did he have connections to those people? Did he have connections to those people? Yeah, he did. Yeah, he did. You know, t talking about it's a memory loss story. I mean, it's an amnesia story. And there's so many movies uh, like that. Did you watch a lot of those memory loss movies? I did. Did it, did it help you in any way come upon a, did. I an mean, idea of what to do? Uh, not really. I mean, I watched, I did a lot of research. I read lots of books and I saw lots of films. And there are lots of films on, on, about memory loss. There's um, Alfred Hitchcock's Spellbound right. was, a, was a fantastic example of that. Of that. And I think one of the, the, the inspiration that I got from Spellbound and other things, and I, I watched some fantastic Man Ray short films as well. Yeah. And I love the sort of surrealist approach to cinema. And I think there are some parallels um, with the power of the un unconscious and how that affected Doug. So I used, um, you know, I tried to pay some homage to to to, to some surrealist uh, filmmakers in the film. But w when I when I watched films like Spellbound, Memento, uh, Abre los ojos, Abre los ojos, yes, films like that, I knew that I had a story that was as good <laughs> as the fiction stories. Right. My, my my real story was as good as theirs. It was just a question as to whether I could do my story justice. But you had to go out and find a lot of material that you could put in to prove your story. Where'd you find all that material? And how'd you decide to, how, how'd you slip it into different places in the movie? Well, the film is, the film is, ma ma is a patchwork of different yeah, formats, exactly. of different time frames. You know, there's Super 8 stuff, and, and video, uh, you know, Super 35. And uh, that's very much like our memories. Uh, you know, some things we can remember with great clarity, other things are, uh, are fuzzy and atmospheric. And so I kind of pu I pulled lots of material from all over the place, from NASA, from my own home movies, um, in a way to kind of reconstruct a life, reconstruct what had happened, happened to him, uh, and intercut that with real footage that I filmed. I felt like you were using a fisheye lens, that your camera was rolling all around the I, place. I really, I really wanted people to experience what it was like to try and experience oh. what it was like to have to have amnesia, to, to wake up one morning and not know who you are, uh, anything about your previous life. So I wanted to give the film a kind of um, experiential uh, element. There, there, um, the idea that he actually lost his memory, that he didn't know you as an old friend, do you think he'll ever get his memory back? It's very difficult to say. When cases are that rare, um, the majority of people do get their memory back, but when they're that rare, it's very difficult to predict what will happen to, to each ind individual person. The chances are it will happen, but they don't know when, um, and, and they don't know wh whether it will happen. So it's, you know. Were you happy sorry. you made the film? Uh, and was Bruce happy that you made the film? Um, <clears throat> I was, I'm extremely happy that I made the film. It's been an incredible experience for me. I've learned an enormous amount about myself, about f the fascinating subject of amnesia, the brain. Um, it's been, and, and the success of the film has been you know, fantastic, not, uh, not what I expected. And, and Doug has also, uh, uh, thankfully, um, appreciated the end product. So that's, that's really important. Thanks a lot for being with us today. Thank you. And thank you for being with us. I'm in, sitting in the studio today with actress Elaine J. Taylor, and we'll be right back for the interview with her. Hi, welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. 
I'm Joan Quinn, and I'm here with Elaine J. Taylor, who was born and raised in Texas. She graduated from Phyllis Wheatley High School and studied business at Texas Southern University. Elaine was on the stage at the Kirk Douglas Theater, the Odyssey, and the Alley in Texas. She's been in film, Heaven's Fall, Some Things Gotta Give, and Lovely and Amazing and on TV in NYPD Blues, Six Feet Under, and The Practice. Elaine is a lifetime member of the prestigious Actors Studio. Studying business doesn't <laughs> seem like the way to get to the stage, Elaine. No, I know, but at that time I had no idea that I was going to wind up on stage. At the time, uh, I told my dad singing was my passion. Oh, you were a singer? I was a singer at the time, you know, brought up in the church, singing in the choir, um, and uh, it was my love. I had taken voice lessons. Um, and I told my dad that I wanted to come to Los Angeles to be a singer. And he just looked at me and said, honey, you're going to go to college and you're going to be a secretary. Oh, is that what? <laughs> Those are my marching orders. That so, was better than a that, teacher. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And at the time, uh, Houston, Texas was the uh, in an energy boom. It was the oil capital of the world. So there were lots of opportunities in terms of, you know, that kind of work. And that's exactly what I did. I went four years to college and I got my, my BS and I went to work in the oil industry as a oh, secretary. You did actually work I as did a secretary? I did do that. I when you did. were at, at uh, high, in high school, mm -hmm. were there other actors? I think somebody else was an actor there <laughs> with you. <laughs> actually, there was. There was Charlie Robinson, uh, the wonderful actor that I'm working with now in Fences at yes. the Odyssey. Did, here, we yes, have that. Yes, exactly. Did you know Charlie? I didn't know Charlie. He was a few years ahead of me, uh -huh. but uh, people knew about him. He's such a strong and powerful person. And in fact, I think he was, he sang in a group called, called The Drells, which was popular at that time. He was a singer he too? Was a, yeah, he was a, singer, <laughs> he was a singer then too. <laughs> so we went to the same high school, and born, up, born in the same uh, city and same neighborhood. So did you go to LA first or did you go to New York? I didn't do New York. Oh, and you did In fact, I tried to ponder, what do I do? Do I go to New York or LA? And because I had relatives here, mm -hmm. and because geographically, L.A. is more like Houston. It's yeah. spread out, and um, New York just seemed a lot more foreign to me, so I chose Los Angeles. We love Houston. We love lo Texas. <laughs> yeah, we love it. It, it is. It seems like home. It, it does seem like more home. More so than New York. It seems like home. That's true. So you started acting. We just talked about Fences. You right. were in that with Charlie, right. Right. directed by Charlie Hayden. At the uh, Jeffrey Hayden. Jeffrey right. Hayden. That's I'm right. Sorry. That's right. <laughs> Charlie Hayden, the musician. You're right. talking about music. Right. And I'm thinking of Charlie. Um, did you act in any other August Wilson plays? Um, actually, I did. I understudied over at the uh, Taper, Gym of the Ocean. I understudied for Felicia Richard, who's another Houstonian. Oh, she is. Uh, she grew up in Houston as well at a different high school. But um, I understudied her a few years ago at the Taper Theater, Gym of the Ocean. And then in Fences, what's your part? You're the mom. I play Rose, Rose Maxson. And tell us about Rose. Uh, well, interestingly enough, the, her name, Rose, I think August Wilson chose that name because his mother was named Daisy. Oh. <laughs> so it's a sort of uh, the use of that, the flower, as the, the, the seeds that help to cultivate, that heal and and grow things and so um, I think that's how Rose was born so um, I'm quite a contrast to to Troy's character which is kind of hard and stubborn and um, passionate and that's she's Charlie more, that's Charlie so my character Rose is more she's the she's the lover she's the the, the caretaker the the healer the the patient one that's interesting that you say that about his mother because he's probably writing that role for his mom. Yeah, he probably had his mom in mind when he when he wrote it. I didn't think about that until yeah. you said it because how many plays did August write? Ten or twelve? Uh, about uh, it's anywhere about from ten a dozen, to twelve. Yeah. Yes, and they they followed they, his they, life. Right, they're right. Supposedly they 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 uh, talk about each decade. Yes. in the African American experience. 
Well, talking about that in the African American experience, here you were being directed by Jeffrey Hayden, who is <laughs> fabulous. I mean, who goes back to the early days of TV, right? All those those plays he that he directed wonderful. and was a part of and and created, right. and then working here mm -hmm. in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. he's directing an African American play. I know. So uh, it's well. Uh, what do you think? Well, I'm happy. I mean, I mean does it he was surprising. understand it? Well, I think he does. I mean, because a lot of fences is just universal. I mean, we, we have a large white audience, and they leave there, they're crying, and they are so thankful to us for presenting some, something of such human value. So it's, it's a story that, that reaches all races. So he understands it on a, on a lot of levels. The thing <laughs> that when I talked to Jeffrey about it, he said, this is a story of family. This is everybody's That's story. Right. It That's just true. happens to be set right. where it's set. Yeah, and of course, you know, there are some particular things that happen that are just particular to African Americans and, and black Americans who grew up in this country. Well, the, the language. The language, Of course, which one. is going to be lost, yeah, right? Yeah, the rhythmic language and, and the way August Wilson writes, particular to the time and particular to the characters that grew up in Pittsburgh during that time. Was it the 50s, 40s? The 50s, 50s, 57. 50s, yeah. 57. So yeah. even though it's a play that everybody can identify with, there are some very specific things that uh, African American audience members, when they sit there, they go, mm-hmm, that's my grandmother, mm-hmm, I know what she's talking about, mm-hmm, that's me. Uh -huh. So And so they yeah. hear the language. Yeah. It's like immigrants coming here and hearing uh, uh -huh. other people talk like their grandmothers spoke, right, just what right. you're saying. Exactly. That's, that's an interesting part yeah. of August Wilson, I think. Mm -hmm. I never understood him until just recently, <laughs> because I didn't get the, the idea that okay. it was a slice of life. I didn't totally. understand it. Totally. I think that's something about it being done on a small stage too that makes it more accessible to the audience to really hear the words. But you said also, you mentioned Rose, mm -hmm. and I know nobody knows this, but you're a poet. <laughs> And I think you have a small piece of poetry. Well, there's a poem that I wrote years and years and years and years ago uh, that reflected my life at the time. Uh, but I think it's, it's very um, much like Rose in the way she relates to her relationships. And so it's a very short poem. So I mean, um, it goes, Black woman that I am, I stand in the crossroads of the wind shifts of your mind as your eyes stare past, glacial in their remoteness. I search your face for traces of inward pain, inward cries, so that I may cry my tears. And if the sun is reflected in you for a day, I feel the warmth of his heat for a day and a night. Your joy is my laughter. Black woman that I am, I embrace your passion as my release. You are my sun. I am your day. Oh. So short, but I think it oh. sort of describes Rose in a way. It's really beautiful. She yeah. was everything, wasn't she? She, was she everything. understood everything. Yeah, and she's not. But it wasn't about Rose. No, not about <laughs> Rose. And she's not. She's. It's not about Rose. It's about Troy. But she's not a passive character either. Yeah. But she. She, I think she's the backbone of the family. The, talking about that and talking about the glacial stare mm -hmm. beyond your shoulder mm -hmm. brings me to that other play you were in, Permanent oh, Collection. Right, right. Because I think you're the, the uh, character in that play was very glacial, wasn't he? Uh, yes, he was. <laughs> He was something else. Are you speaking of? Uh, are you speaking of Ben Gillery's character? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. He was very complex character. But who, very cold. Yeah. Very very cold, but passionate. I, I think maybe the coldness because he thought he was right. Permanent really collection right. was um, at the Kirk Douglas Theater in mm -hmm. Culver City, mm -hmm. and it was put on by the Center Theater Group. Yes. And yes. you mentioned the taper earlier. Yes. And yes. that. The collection of work over there is great, isn't oh, it? I'm having a great, I've had a great, great experience working in both those theaters, Kirk Douglas theaters, state of the art, wonderful, wonderful stage. So my experience then working in permanent collection, that play, which is such, 
fabulous, wonderful play. Tell us about Ben. Tell us a little bit about that play. Uh, that play, oh my God, it was great. It w is loosely based on the Barnes Foundation, which is the foundation again in Philadelphia. Yeah, and you brought uh, that up. Very right? interesting. <laughs> yeah, two plays. Yeah, exactly. In. And so the play dealt with the fact that uh, the the Morris Foundation, as it was called in the play, um, left the running of the foundation to uh, a black college, and the black college appointed this one African American to run it. And he comes into the foundation, and there's alway, already uh, infrastructure there, already people who are working there who um, uh, adopt a wait-and-see attitude about how he's going to, to run the, the facility. And he knocks heads with uh, people there because he wants to come in and make changes immediately. He wants to make black art more prominent. And of course, the rule there is that nothing can be changed. Well, it's all the so, Impressionists in the, the original. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So uh, the African-American uh, manager wants to come in and put, you know, black art at the forefront. Too. I thought that was interesting, too. Very the point interesting. was interesting. Very interesting. And in many ways, they did go together. Right, right. I felt that there was a cohesiveness Absolutely. about the, I, I think so, too. Yeah. And I actually did visit the barns myself. Oh, I good to, for you. I, I had to make a trip there. You it. had to make an appointment, I too. Did. <laughs> and I had to make an appointment to go see it. And it was, and there, the, the art does exist. I know. Side by side. Isn't that so great? So it's, it's wonderful. It's well, wonderful you know, but you um, write poetry. You act on stage. Do you mm -hmm. continue to take classes? I did up until I started working on stage this year. Uh, I continue to take classes. Of course, I work at the studio as well, which there you can put up scenes and the do work as well. The actor studio. Yes. Uh, which Mark Rydell is the moderator, and Martin Landau oh, is also the moderator. They there. were there at your play yes, the day they were. I came. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's They're great it. They're great supporters. They're great supporters. Because when we did Fences at first, it was at the actor studio facility on on Sunset Boulevard. Oh, I see. So I work at the studio, and then I, I work with other uh, teachers here in the city. So I constantly work. So if I'm not on stage, I'm in somebody's classroom. Oh, you are? <laughs> I have to be in somebody's classroom to keep the chops alive. Well, I'm so glad you came in today. I had. Thank you so much for asking. Me. Thank you. It was very interesting. And thank you all for watching the Joan Quinn Profiles today. Keep writing to 777 South Figueroa, 44th floor, Los Angeles, 90017. See you next time.